live from McMinimins on Broadway. <laughs> it's Long Box Review, here with your host. Oh my god. <laughs> Eric, who it's can't stop laughing. Eric, who can't stop laughing. That was perfect. And special guest stars. See, I won't have to do an introduction now, uh, because Matt, Wednesday's Serial is here. I have a nickname. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Along with <laughs> Damien, Sleepy Reader. 666. Six, 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 six. I can't even remember my own See, I, my I, evil I, numbers. I love to say that. <laughs> Sleepy Reader 666. Six, six. That's great. Those numbers work. It's not just some random hodgepodge of numbers that some True. people have. Edward. And I have occasionally gotten comments on my <laughs> channel. You don't want it. Oh my god. Asking if, if there's some demonic reason behind me using those numbers. And I say, yes, of course. <laughs> made a deal with the devil with, to get YouTube the, famous <laughs> Ooh, that's yes. the story I want to hear yes I had to have sex with the devil whoa and then <laughs> and then he made whoa, me whoa, famous whoa 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 this is, this is a family friendly epi- uh, podcast here so. oh I'm sorry okay. it's bedazzled yeah. it was exactly like the devil okay so so this is the ruby have you had this before yeah, in the, uh, not in recent years. No, but. yeah, I don't like this. Uh-oh. Not good. Compared to what I have. Oh, this is long box uh, beer reviews. I'm branching out. Oh, okay. Ugh, no, that's not okay. good. Here, I'll. So the, uh, uh, McMinimins has withdrawn their sponsorship. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's pretty good. Do oh, you like that? Yeah. Do you want me to buy you another beer? You have to do that. Go ahead. Too short you want it. To Go ahead. Beer, you know? I, I'm gonna. I'll, I'll get one of those. You can have that one. Well, do you want to test drink it from the other side? Sure. Yeah. It's like they're making out right here, live on microphone. All right, you guys. Thank you. Very well. Oh, that oh, is that a that is large. Thing. Wow. Is there any yeah. other thing I can get for anybody here? Was that purple haze? Water. Another purple haze. Okay. Yeah, I'll yeah. take a purple haze. Okay, so two purple hazes. No, just one. Just one. And, and a glass of water. And a glass of water. Okay. Or two glasses. Of water. All right. There we go. We okay. just received a boat of French fries. You're not kidding. <laughs> that smells really good, actually. Well, there's enough to go around to get. <laughs> yeah, we were talking about uh, diets earlier today. We were. <laughs> this is not going to help. No. Oh, but but suckers. but see this is this is my my, my take when I, whenever I go to a con I feel like all the walking around that I do justifies the any amount of, of food intake that I have any amount any amount it's it's the rule of <laughs> it's one of the rules of cons so I don't worry about it I don't okay, worry about well, my diet you can have your 50 percent of those <laughs> 50, I don't think so. I think stress then is a bigger want, killer than French fries. I'll just out of this enjoy. Bar, yeah. we'll have to roll you. I'm well, also, whoa. Yeah. Consider, well, considering the, the, the week I had at work, uh, stress it played a factor, yeah. Mm. I'm See, not, this I'm will not, help. Yeah, I'm not a stress eater by any means, but man, I was. Apparently, I, I worked off some calories uh, a couple days at work this week. Now you can do gotcha. some stress drinking. That's right. That's called relaxation. It's called therapy where I'm from. <laughs> therapy. Well, did you find the Road City Comic Con relaxing? Relaxing? No. I would not say relaxing, but, it, but very enjoyable. You brought a whole family to it. Does yeah. that uh, make it trickier? Or you're not really. a pretty smooth, smooth well, the old con well, family? Con- consider, yeah, considering how many cons we've taken uh, the girls to and how many cons that uh, Kitra and I have been to, just the two of us, it works out really well. So... My own daughter went for the first time to a con. Oh, this was the first time? Yes. I thought she went the last time you... No, no. Last year I just zipped in on my own on Sunday. Oh, okay. So, and she loved seeing all the costumes. um, But just the long walk we had to do to go get our tickets. (laughs) (laughs) Because we arrived at the far end of the convention center. Okay. And we had to walk all the way. She's just kind of low energy. Wait, so, so you didn't buy your tickets ahead of time? I did buy tickets ahead of time, but then you have to trade them in for the... Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Did but, you not have to do that? Well, we ordered them online, and, and they, they sent us the, the badges. 
Really? Yeah. Okay, so I bought tickets at Things from Another World, oh, the comic store. Okay, I heard about that. And they yeah. gave me a. It's a very nice looking ticket, but you had to trade that in to get the lanyard. Which was good because when I saw the line for the uh, people just showing up to get in, I, I about fainted. That would have been horrible to wait through that line. Oh it yeah, was, yeah. When we first walked up, it room. looked like looked like an enormous line, but then it turned out most of those people were waiting to get their picture taken. Wait, so how did you get your? I bought he his bought too. Oh, oh, okay. oh, I should probably pay you back because huh? we knew well, <laughs> we knew well in advance that he was coming. So. This is a plan in six months in the making. Yeah, skipped a wedding to be here. Wow, was it your own? <laughs> <laughs> Whoops. Yeah, now I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> oh, <laughs> man, you're cold. So she'll never get this. <laughs> So I've, this is only the, I guess, the third con I've ever been to. Wow. And I was very amazed by all the costumes. I mean, I've seen pictures in YouTube videos and stuff, but it just seemed like an enormous number of people put a huge amount of work into their costumes. What were the, what were some of the best ones you saw? There was this, like, horned stag guy on stilts, you know, looking like some kind of old English nature god or something. There were a bunch of other creatures that I can't even really describe because I didn't know what their sources were. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I guess that stag guy stands out in my mind. You know the one I'm talking about? I saw him, but there was another costume that stood out to me. There were other better ones, but I just can't even think of them. Well... So I've never been a big fan of Gwen Stacy, but I saw this girl. I saw a few girls. Whoa, 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 whoa! <laughs> what? <laughs> Gwen Stacy? Yeah, you know, Spider-Man grew character. Up in Every, Mary Jane. Everyone's favorite Spider-Man girlfriend. No, everyone's <laughs> favorite Spider-Man girlfriend's Black Cat. Come on. <laughs> All right, go. I'm sorry. Go ahead. But Gwen Stacy always seemed weird to me as a girlfriend because she didn't like Spider-Man. They never seemed to get along. I didn't understand. You are. I think you are missing a, a huge well, well, history of well, hold issues on, here. Hold on, hold on. <laughs> so there's plenty of Gwen, like Spider Gwens around, but there's someone just dressed as Gwen Stacy, like oh, perfectly, really? like stepped right out of the comic. Damn, I missed that. Well, I was staring at her all over time, but uh, <laughs> I saw her and I got it right ah, then. Ah. Like it made sense all of a sudden. There you go. It's the only cosplay I've ever seen that, like, changed my opinion of a character retroactively. When I say uh, stare, I don't mean the creepy way. Like, I, it was just, like, it was perfect. That, that just stood out to me. And it's, I mean, compared to, you know, like you said, the crazy Minotaur, there's some other crazy ones. I saw some video game characters that were done very well. Um, and those costumes take a different sort of engineering to Mm -hmm. do but this was a subtle one but it was so perfect and if you can do Gwen Stacy just you know the blonde hair the hair band the just her general because she kind of had a Gwen Stacy outfit frankly Mm -hmm. that she wore the girl just did it perfect like in order to do something like that you have to do it perfect to make it stand out so I wish I'd seen that there was a point and gawk (laughs) (laughs) There was a Hellboy who there was. scared me. He just looked really like he was from Hell. I mean, I, I honestly, he looked a little more like Hellboy than Ron Perlman does. He in did. The he was better, a better Hellboy than Ron Perlman. Wow. Yeah. Apparently, I spent way too much time on the show floor because I didn't see any of these. Wow. We just wandered. We saw him between getting to the show floor between panels, or yeah, they're just huh. I mean, I saw some good things, right. but nothing that was like. That really wowed me. Then there was a purple woman who looked entirely naked, and I'm not sure what she was wearing to make herself look completely naked. Was this was this a, the Mystique girl? I saw some pictures. On... I don't think she was Mystique. Okay. Because she maybe she was supposed to be Mystique, and I misunderstood. I thought she was some. There's so many of them were like anime characters or other things that are gaming characters that I just don't know. There was a, on the Rose City Face Rose City Comic Con Facebook page because they taking their pictures and posted them there was i saw uh 
Sunday morning, I saw the post and it was a girl with, uh, who dressed up as Mystique and it looked like she was just basically covered in paint on the front. Right. And so I'm looking at this going, this passed? They, they were okay with this? That's good yeah. enough for the movie. Yeah. <laughs> I had no complaints. Mystique usually has like these patterns on her skin. Yeah, and then and she the did that. One, the one I saw didn't have patterns on her skin. Okay. I saw a few Poison Ivies that left very little to the imagination. There were a number of little to the imagination characters. Yeah. But, um, Including, well, but they I... stay in my imagination. That's the <laughs> ironic. I hope you're enjoying this, Crystal. <laughs> <laughs> she appreciates it almost more than I do. Too. Oh, okay. Well, that's the skill, also. the artistry, right? <laughs> well, and the... Hot bodies. The hanging out. Well, there were there were a few um, cosplayers of. Now, you guys mentioned the video game stuff. Mm-hmm. That's something that I have very little reference for, because I didn't play a whole lot of video games when I was younger, and or now for that matter. But uh, so so I so I see these characters. I have no idea who they are. But what you were saying before, Matt, about about the, the, the a different level or, or different uh, technique or whatever they do. Well, so there's one character that I saw from a game called Overwatch who was Genji's the character, but he's a cyborg ninja. And this guy clearly constructed with plastic and metal this, like, full exoskeleton costume to fit him. Like, that's... You have to engineer that. That's not just getting clothing together, but he, which is another skill, too. I'm not trying to downplay that, but mm-hmm. I'm saying this is a whole other thing, too, that... It was very impressive. And there was, like, LED lights built in and whatnot. Like, that's something else. That's right. very impressive. Like, even if you don't know the character, it still looks very impressive. Yes, that that's my point. Is I see these characters from these video games. I, I don't have a frame of reference, but, man, do they make an impression. Yeah, they're so good. That's why I have trouble saying which were the good ones, because I, I just saw these, you know, like, there were these men with full face masks on and these long robes and just looked like they stepped out of a movie, but a movie I've never seen. Right. right. Oh, I did see one guy who just had on a fish head and a pair of underwear. And I saw that guy I saw too. That guy too. Uh, what, what do they call that? Uh, magic carp. I think uh, that was one of the captions oh, really? I saw. Yeah, yeah. It's called. It's it's a thing. I apparently. <laughs> but yeah, he was just wearing really tight, I don't know, shorts and and the fish head thing, and that yeah. was it. We may soon be getting the equivalent of those naked purple women with men. I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What was interesting, too, as I saw a comment about this, was there was kind of the ubiquitous male Heath Ledger Joker costume that was very popular and still is. But now we have the it's, Harley Quinn from Suicide yeah, Squad, which yeah. I saw a number There's of. much more of that. Oh, my gosh. So, so Madison, the, my, my uh, 10-year-old, I right. almost said 8-year-old again, my 10-year-old granddaughter, she's a huge Harley Quinn fan. And so at one point, uh, uh, the, the first day of... of at the end of the first day of the, of the con, I asked her, so how many Harley Quinns did you did you see today? And she's like, basically, I, I saw three, maybe four. I'm like, are you kidding me? She must not recognize the <laughs> no, movie one. No, because there's so... Well, no, she does. I mean, because oh, okay. I took her to see that. Oh, but, she did see it. But I just think she wasn't really paying attention yeah. because that seemed to, to me, seemed to be the most prevalent yeah. cosplay uh, th- at this con. I feel like I saw 40 or 50 Harley Quinns. At Quinn. least, yeah. But there were, there were a handful of the classic Harley yes. twins. And I, think and I, I saw, like those the best. I did so. too. I think I saw one that was the Amanda Connor designed um, Harley Quinn. At least I think she, you know the one I'm talking about, the current comic Harley oh, yeah, Quinn, yeah, yeah. not the yeah. movie. I think she designed that customer. Was it the probably. artist on that book? I don't know. Yeah. but Probably Amanda Connor did. There was one Squirrel Girl. I was thinking I would see more Squirrel Girls. Huh. I didn't maybe see there them. were more Squirrel Girls, but there was one very good Squirrel Girl I saw. And that takes a lot of work to make this tail that mm-hmm. sticks out and doesn't flop around but goes up in the air. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know what I didn't see? My there? daughter was very excited to see the squirrel girl. Oh, yeah. I didn't see a squirrel girl <laughs> trade, which I was looking for because it was talked <laughs> up to me all week and I wanted to read it and I couldn't find the trade. Well, okay, let's talk about that because I was kind of disappointed in my comic book hunting at this show. And yeah. I don't know, I don't know if that's because, well, it, it is partly because I. I'm less focused on trying to buy back issues than I have been in years past. Um, I, I've been looking more at the art and buying more art and prints and stuff like that. Although, 
I, I, I instituted so you won the lottery. I instituted no, just allocating my funds from one thing to another. Uh, and well actually, said. and actually, and actually, spent less money on those things that I than I would have normally. But anyway, that's funny. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I was kind of disappointed in that. Well, I haven't I been into enough cons, but it felt like a very small percentage of of the floor space was given over to yes. places selling comics. Yeah, yeah, and, and I guess that's <clears throat> not really a complaint. It's just I, I was kind of surprised at that. I guess I, I expected a little Is bit more. Is there more at other ones that you go to? Well, Emerald City. Yeah, there's a lot of and, and larger booth space for the uh-huh. for the comic vendors. I felt like it was very uh, cramped. I felt like I like comics. Who was at Rose City mm-hmm. had the biggest. Yeah, that was the uh, only really big space. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Of course, course, they have a lot too. I bought most of the comics I bought there because they had they had the best prices too. They had That's cheap true. comics that weren't just like quarter bin or fifty cent bin, like unfiled whatever. I don't have the patience to deal with that anymore. Oh my god, me either. I, I see that, and I just walk right on by. I'll flip through maybe a little bit to see if something catches my eye sometimes, because every now and then you get super lucky. If you spend 30 seconds, you'll find something, and I'm willing to let my interest be piqued, but it's my interest is not as easily as piqued anymore. <laughs> so, But, yeah, I definitely found some stuff, but there are very few trades on sale. There was basically one vendor selling trades. Or to, cheap trades. Well, yeah, cheap trades. There was one place that was like, buy one, get one free, but they only had, like, super modern stuff. And it was buy... Wasn't it buy one, get one 50% off? Yeah. Which basically meant it was 25% off. If you buy. But you have to buy two. And then... Well, and there was stuff like Oni had a bunch of trades there, and Image had some trades there, but they're all full price, which I find hilarious at a convention. Because mm-hmm. you're selling me Walking Dead 23 at full price, like, I could find that cheaper somewhere else. Yeah. Is, it, is there some deal that publishers make with distributors that when they sell their own books, they won't try to discount them? You're asking the wrong guy. Yeah. It, it's always seemed that way to me. If you want to order comics, even online, directly from the publisher, they'll have their website and they'll sell it to you full price and charge you postage on top of it. But then you can go to someone else like Amazon or... Oh, other places and get it discounted with yeah. cheaper postage. That always bugs so me. So I wonder if some part of their distribution deal is that they won't try to undercut, undercut other their, sellers yeah. of their books. You probably have, uh, yeah, you probably have a point there. That's probably accurate. So I think that's why uniformly all the publisher booths just sell things for cover price. Then why show up? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're there not just to sell books, but to you know, Pimpo. no image. I mean, uh, brand branding too. You know, let people be aware of their brand, even if they don't buy the books. From yeah. There. Well, like you didn't know Oni had the Oni mask as their logo. Right. I never noticed what the Oni logo was. Ah, okay. Did you know Oni has the devil mask mm-hmm. as the logo? Mm-hmm. I didn't notice that. Well, it used to be a far more prominent mm-hmm. in their their advertising than I think it is today. That's fair. I think I buy three Oni books a month. I never noticed what the logo was. I, think I, get, look. I get one. I get none. Isn't isn't letter forty four an Oni book? Yes. Yeah. That's still going. You don't get yeah. the life after. No. Don't you don't it. obey Travis. What does he know about comics? He's the one who got me on that. <laughs> Just kidding, Travis. <laughs> I'm not. He doesn't even like Deadpool or Ninja <laughs> Turtles or anything good. Well, yeah, and he also likes Green Arrow, for that matter. He got me onto Green Arrow. Oh, jeez. I'll give him that much. Oh, jeez. You're not dropping Green Arrow? Oh, oh the, the new one. I'm talking about the good oh, Green okay. Arrow. Ooh. What's the good Green Arrow? Uh, the uh, It started with the Kevin Smith run, which isn't necessarily good stuff, but um, <laughs> Bill Hester and okay. stuff yeah. later on did some amazing things. Not that the Mike Rell? I haven't read that, but I want to. And I just Whoa, procured yeah. some of it, so I'll be reading that. Uh, when you say when you say some of it, oh, <laughs> never mind. Um, what is it? Longbow hunters or after that? I have longbow hunters, and I've read that years ago because I was able to find okay. that. But um, but the ongoing that he that yeah he, the ongoing okay. stuff I've wanted to read, but um, <clears throat> just found a way to read that. Yeah, through your local library or something. I'm Hopefully sure. The fifth. <laughs> I'm giving you an out, man. 
So in comparison to other cons, this did have less comic book dealers then? Yes. Sorry, I just... Uh, no, I don't. And did, did the number of... The proportion of people in costume, is that about the same as other cons? Or any different? Uh, just kind of... Roughly Average. speaking, yeah, it seemed like it seemed like about the same okay. to me. Yeah, yeah. Maybe I was paying because I last year I went just on Sunday to this con, hmm. and I don't remember. I remember costumes, but I just don't remember quite the number of costumes. Yeah, yeah. You know what I? And what, then costuming or cosplaying didn't even exist when I went to a con in 1981. <laughs> That's true. But. Uh, <clears throat> One thing I really liked about this con was... Now, see, I, I went to Rose City, I, I want to say, about three years ago. So this is the fifth anniversary I saw, the fifth year for this show. Uh-huh. And I'm pretty sure we went to the second year, maybe the third. I'll have to look it up, but it was it was early on. And uh, it really reminded me of how Emerald City was for us the first time that we went to it. And now, so we've been going to Emerald City for several years now. Uh And now it's just huge, huge in comparison to what it was. And this felt like that. It felt like the very Uh first time we went. And I really like that. This this is the perfect size for us now. Because with Emerald City, it's it's now three and a half days. And, you know, 80,000 people show up to that con. Is it just a constant battle to get from one place to another basically or? yeah yeah I mean, I mean don't get me wrong it's a great show but right. but it's just it's just huge and you <laughs> I feel exhausted after that weekend that long weekend going to that show and this one felt just right and so I'm really excited to come back <laughs> <laughs> well I'm glad show. to hear that <laughs> have you done any other cons or um yeah if you listen to his podcast, you know that he went. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot, Matt. <laughs> what was that called? Heroes Con? <laughs> yeah, I went to, just went to Heroes Con. So yeah, that was the last concert, or concert con I went to, was Heroes Con in, in uh, North Carolina. There's, there's, there's a uh, more or less a local con uh, in Spokane, Washington that I've gone to, but that's... Oh, that's cool. That's... Is that a weekend long? Or really, it's just one day, yeah. Uh-huh. Local creator kind of thing? Uh, he tries, yeah. <laughs> the, 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 the con guy tries to get okay. as many. He, he's actually tried to get Stan Lee to come. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think. No, no, I'm no, I'm sorry. I'm thinking of of, of that guy's competitors who just kind of came to prominence just a few years ago. And, and their first con in Spokane, they got Stan Lee to come. I don't know how they did it. So anyway. They out a lot of money, I guess. Yeah, I, yeah. Well, I don't think they did another con after that. So they went broke, maybe. <laughs> Just to bring Stan Lee. But Stan Lee was, speaking of Stan Lee, Stan Lee was at Rose City Comic Con. Oh, right. And I circled him on my schedule, but didn't end up bothering to go. Yeah. Yeah, I don't. No I, interest in that? None. So I heard that, that this was his, he was, he was they done. They wrote that it's his last Northwest appearance. Yes. Yeah. So if you didn't go see Stan Lee today, or this weekend, I'll never see Stan you'll never see Stan Lee again. I'm still mad at him. <laughs> what? For how he treated Steve Ditko? Well, partially, yes. <laughs> and Jack Kirby? Yes. We've but, been talking about Steve Ditko a lot this week. Well, so and, I helped run uh, Denver Comic Con for the first two years and Comic Fest prior to that. And for the first three years, the major guests just did not show up for those cons. And one year it was Stan Lee. And, and he didn't show up? No, because he had a movie to do. Oh, but well. he decided that later. Here's the thing: it's not that he had a movie to do; it's that he said he was going to do the con, then he ended up doing the movie, and we were SOL. But you have to understand the amount of money and time and coordination that goes into asking someone like Stanley to come to a convention is someone's part-time job, basically, to wrangle. And so, when that happened. Like, you're worried because now Stanley isn't coming. As it doesn't matter how fast you say it or what you do. People are horribly disappointed and more disappointed than you are, and you want to please them. And it, it leaves a raw feeling in your mouth. Yeah. And with it happening with Will Whedon, Stanley, and then Neil Gaiman, 
I just... Celebrities suck. <laughs> <laughs> it pains me to hear you say that Neil Gaiman and, and Will Wheaton did that to you guys. Well, Will Wheaton, I really Especially don't Especially Neil Gaiman. Neil Gaiman was the worst to me for that. And I love Neil Gaiman's work. Him as a person now, I find questionable. So... <laughs> Whoa. I've never met him. I don't know. But here's what happened was, in order in order to get Neil Gaiman to agree to consider to do a speaking, because he's requested so often, because he's so popular. requestable. Uh, yeah, it's popular. Um, it, it takes somewhere around a million dollars saved wow. up to do it. it. It's a large sum of money. And then... A million dollars for Neil Gaiman? Well, ten thousand. You've blown my mind. It's tons of money. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa! I might not have the exact ten thousand and a million. That's a, a yeah, that's a, that's a factor of a mag- magnitude it's a zero. there. I, I honestly, <laughs> yeah. but it's a large sum of money in order to get him to speak, and then so it was all lined up, and then oh no, he's decided he has to write, which great, he has dude, to write a book. Dude, I understand. Had a then, deadline. Come on. But then don't agree in the first don't place. Don't agree in the first place right, if you right, right. can't, if you know you can't you know, guarantee. Come on, come on, you guys don't know publishers. They are <laughs> evil, evil people. And they will mess you up if you miss your deadline. You don't like Marvel Publishing? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> I don't know what I'm talking about. Neil Gaiman used to be two feet taller until he missed that first deadline. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Okay, so so, so you so you, so what I'm hearing is you hold grudges. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Especially against rich celebrities who take your money and then don't come. Luckily, it wasn't my money. But no, wait, 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 wait. So they still get the money? No. Okay. No, I mean they broke the contract. The fact you had to work up that much money. Sure, sure, and then yeah, but some money is lost. And right, and and all the the effort put into it, and then. And you look, you have mud on your face because you've publicized this person showing up. And right, don't. right. Well, but the other thing, so when you're doing a con, and here's something. If you're going to go to a con, you know you're going to go, but you figure you're just going to pick up tickets at the door. Don't. A, you, when you support a con, if you buy the tickets early, they'll be cheaper. Yay for you. But you're going to get a better convention. Because what they're trying to do is they need numbers and head counts. That allows them to get advertising. That allows them to get names. And when they reach certain thresholds, they can um, get bigger guests or more guests. And so in order to get that level of guests, you have to put on something in the con. And Denver Comic Con blew up. It was a surprise to a lot of people, not a surprise to a lot of others. It makes a lot of sense when you think about it because it was the only major convention in the region. It was the Comic Con for Colorado, Wyoming, Kansas. Like, there's a Kansas Comic Con, but it's... It's a vendor con, not a comic con, if you've seen the difference. But I don't know if you guys know what that means. or Because it's kind of a colloquial. A vendor con, is that a convention for people in the industry to sell to A vendor con is more like you're in a uh, convention, not like a big convention center like we went to, but a convention hall, and there's like 20 booths. 10, 15 guests, and there you go. Like, it is a significantly smaller thing, but it is completely comics, maybe one or two media guests. Really, a really small affair. Really yeah, small local affair. Comparatively. Yeah. I mean, it's a big thing, and people come out in town, and some people will travel. Mm-hmm. Um, but it, compared to a Comic Con, which is an entire convention <clears throat> center filled up and taken up, and you have numbers you have people just going for cosplay you have people going for just video game related stuff you have people just like us going for comic panels and to buy comics and you have some people probably just working the trip the show floor looking for key issues and filling the runs or whatever you just get you get all these different kinds of crowds not just people milling through the floor maybe getting to go to one of the five panels so i've been rambling what are we talking about (laughs) well this whole thing with you need to build up your numbers so then you can get a big celebrity guest. Yeah. Seems like a really dangerous trend to me anyway. Um, because it, like then you always have to get bigger and you always have to get bigger guests. And it's always going to become more crowded and less about what well, it originally was about. 
because you need these numbers and stuff. Let me yeah. tell you the yeah. limit. There's a fire code. Right. Uh-huh. <laughs> and you can only sell so many tickets. Right. And that's well, that's that's San Diego. You know, you buy but, your tickets and they sell out and eventually get to a point where that it becomes a different cycle. But it sounds like Emerald City is hitting that roof. Well, it is for me. And yeah. Because what you, what you were just saying, that, that's exactly what I was thinking about Emerald City, was that it's it's kind of, you know, they, they start bringing in more and right. more of these bigger celebrity guests. Right. Um, and, yeah, of course, more people show up. Of course, they make more money. All this stuff. They, they expanded uh, in the convention center beyond what, what it, you know, when I first started going. And, you know, that's all great um, because it just brings a lot more people into our niche, pr- potentially. Right. Potentially, some people will actually discover comics at conventions. In fact, I've heard some YouTube people, younger YouTube people, mention they first bought a comic book at a convention. Yeah. Which, to me, blew my mind. Right? Yeah. Like, how did you think to go to a convention if you hadn't read a comic book? <laughs> yeah. But it's a different thing now. It's right, like you right. go to the convention to dress up and hang out with your friends, and then you happen to buy a comic book. And well, some of them think, wow, it's cool, and they start making YouTube yeah, videos yeah. about so, it. So, yeah, to that point, um, uh, one of... One of the the people that my wife and I work with that are at the company that we work at, um, Slavery Incorporated, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on certain days perhaps. Uh, but uh, um, she and her family are really big into kind of like the sci-fi stuff you know, on, on television and movies, and so they've they've often talked about going to a con, and they decided this would be their first one, and so. Uh, she, uh, the coworker, was drawn in into Rose City because she heard that Carl Urban was going to be here. Uh, unfortunately, he, uh, he he canceled. Who did you say? Who? Yeah, who? Carl Urban? Who's that? <laughs> Doctor McCoy in the new Star Trek movies. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Judge Dredd recent in the last movie. That was the same guy. Yeah. Huh. He was in Lord of the Rings too. I don't do movies. Oh, okay. Who was he in Lord of the Rings? Uh, don't ask. I have no, no idea. Some obscure, he, he, more obscure person. Okay, so uh, tangent, but so you know that scene where they're walk, uh, the, the, the the fellowship was walking along in this uh, um, area, and they get they get surrounded by the riders of Rohan. Yes, he's one of the riders of Rohan. Uh. I don't know which one, but he's blonde. I think he's blonde uh. in that movie. He's like, that's Carl Urban. What? Anyway, so he's a great so, Doctor McCoy. Yeah. So. Uh, so he uh, he was going to be here, and so she's a big fan of his, and that drew them in. She came anyway. We actually we actually got to see her once, just walking around. There she was. So we talked to her for a few minutes, but 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 that you know that's bringing the celebrity guest right. brings in a you know a broader range of people. So I, I totally get that. I totally yeah. get that. But 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 I but I love how where Rose City is right now, where they they seem to be really focused on comics and 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 artists, not just artists of comic books but 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 other right. kinds of artists too well i have to say the way that they did media it felt like it was a separate track and was there for separate people like i was aware of the super na- supernatural the show not the general idea going on because my girlfriend got me hooked on that show so like when i see it i i know it <laughs> and so i was able to see all that stuff but i'm here for the comics still and by the way the only dr mccoy for me is hank mccoy and oh <laughs> oh we got a purist here, folks. <laughs> I don't even like the original Star Trek. Okay. Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. I don't think you even like the original X-Men. That's, that's true, actually. <laughs> Who does? Ooh. You just don't like Stanley. original things. I love, I love the original Turtles, the oh, semi-original Deadpool. The, uh... I, I, was, I was off base then. Yeah, I actually like the original X-Men, <laughs> so I'm one of the few. Wait, wait, wait! I know, Snowman or Iceman? Ooh, well, <laughs> Iceman and Angel were never my favorites. But, oh, okay. Uh, was he called Snowman in the two issues? Oh, well, he looked like he a was snowman. Oh, he looked snowman. like a snowman. I don't know if they called him Iceman or Snowman. They called him Iceman, but he was Snowman yeah. for a while, basically, until he became an Omega level mutant. I loved oh, yeah. all the, the thought balloons where they were all thinking, I love her, but she never notices me. And like, it's so melodramatic, right? Thinking, I actually like that a lot. <laughs> you know, that Professor Xavier is just so much more free in the 60s. 
I must have read them all. <laughs> you know, at some point the X-Men switched over to just being reprints, and I think that's when I came in. Oh, right. Mm-hmm. So I read a lot of the early X-Men through mm-hmm. that. But that's a total tangent. <laughs> no, I didn't come that's in right. until uh, X-Men 1. With Jim Lee. With Jim Lee and Chris Claremont. Jim the man Lee. You know, every com- <laughs> comes into X-Men with Chris Claremont. It seems like it, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So what, what else um, about the Rose City Comic Con did we appreciate, enjoy? I like that you could walk into panels. That was big for me. As opposed to... Waiting in line for an hour if you want to And get then into not being able to get into the room? If you, wait for, if you wait for an hour at any con and you can't get into a room, you should be mad. Yes. Um, but, no, like, if we want to go to a panel... And if I want to go to a panel, then immediately go to another panel because there were no lines. I could just jump. And that was beautiful i love that you know i i hadn't really thought about it but now that you bring it up that is i really appreciate that too I, again i now emerald, that i know that you can't do that at other cons i really appreciate well it too. as you say emerald, i had fun hopping between panels yeah you know? emerald city was like that where i would <clears throat> i would go line up I, 15 so normally you know about 15 minutes before a panel i'll start hitting that way right you can't do that with with emerald city and some of those panels mm. like like going the, the Image Comics panel that, mm-hmm. that you and I went to, Damien? Right. Uh, the last one in Emerald City I went to, I arrived 15, 20 minutes, actually it was about 20 minutes early, got in line, and they'd already capped it off. Wow. Because the room was filled. They, they couldn't right. let anybody else in. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, I really appreciate the fact that we could, we could do exactly what right. you said. Matt. But yeah, I, and this weekend I would, I would go for one panel for a half hour and then just slip over to the other one for a half hour. Because hearing um, creators talk was, uh, yeah, half an hour for many of Sometimes them was, a half hour was enough. San Sakai was a great example of that. He was right, he was interesting for a while. Fascinating yeah. me for the first half an hour. And a lot of it was on the commentator more than... The moderator. Com- yes, the moderator. <laughs> You're what the I commentator. Say? All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, screw that guy. <laughs> uh, well, but, so... It was super interesting for me because I'm starting to like and appreciate manga more since I got back from Japan. And um, hearing about Usagi Ujimbo, like he didn't say it directly, but it was kind of a bridge between American comics and manga. I mean, it's set in feudal Japan. It's written by this Asian American guy who has a. I think he was Issei, right? Second generation. I think he was born in Japan. And then moved to oh, Hawaii. that's right. No, yeah. So he would have. I don't even know what that word is. Um, first generation, in the United States, and but Hawaii. So, and uh, but I mean, you know. But I mean, it was as he put it, came out at the perfect time, right after the Ninja Turtles. So Yusagi and Jimbo was able to ride on the coattails of that rise that the turtles had. Also, greatly, like there's no like animosity there. Like he was published by Mirage, and they those guys get along very well apparently but also while he's being recognized by will eisner and whatnot he's also being recognized by the the greats on the other side too and they appreciated the comic as well and so like it's very much this blending of two worlds that really appreciate that comic and now i really want to read it (laughs) but then the and we both own some Usagi Ojimbo that we haven't read, right? Right. Um, <laughs> well, you're one up on me because I, I, I have nothing, and I've not I've not read anything. So this I'm I'm woefully I, inadequate in that area. I have read one thing, which was delightful. It was this a Usagi Ojimbo color special. Mm. And the reason I haven't read the other stuff I have is because I want it in color. <laughs> <laughs> and other than that one issue, as far as I know, it never appears in color. I will say it's a comic that would do better to have color because I mean it's an anthropomorphic cartoonish comic. Not having right. color does feel like a misstep, but also is probably an economic reality to start. But at this point, is it has odd. very nice line work, but he doesn't use any shading or anything like that. Yeah, it's not so a, it, it hmm. can very easily be colored. But if you pull back and maybe if you hmm. shape the side, the pages different, it does definitely have a kind of a simpler manga look to it in some ways. I think so. Well, I think you're right. It is probably a bridge. Because it also has a lot of American yes. feel to it. And I think, um, I don't know, I think it might be the kind of thing that could be a big hit if it were recolored and 
sold by Scholastic the way Bone like, was. Yeah, I was going to say Bone, yeah. I think it's an uh, untapped gold mine, perhaps. Mm-hmm. I mean, I haven't read other than those Although, ironically, Bone, Those I have it black good. and white, and I think that comic's fine in black and white, especially because the main colors <laughs> are white, and so... Yeah. That's true, but actually, it's very fun to read in color. Yeah, it is. Oh, I'm, it's fun to read in black and white. It's a cool... Yeah. It's, yeah. it's an undisputed classic. Yeah, right. Right. yeah, but I guess... Someone has probably disputed it. Well, <laughs> I also got the entire thing for black and white and like for 30 bucks. Did so you buy the bible size one? Yeah. Ah. So that, that helped me enjoy it a little more, too. So what other, speaking of the panels, like you, you mentioned the Stan Sakai one. Right. So what other, what other panels did you enjoy? I think we recently? both loved the Terry Moore one the most. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is that, I think we both. Yeah, yeah that, that, was, that was fascinating. It's maybe the one thing we agree on in all of life. So what, <laughs> <laughs> so what, was, what was it about the Terry Moore panel that you, you liked? I mean, so I had a very different impression of him as a creator, and he's one of the few creators that, like, his life story actually, I kind of care about, because normally I don't care about a creator's background so much, mostly because they're usually boring. Um, (laughs) But I had an impression that Terry Moore was a fairly boring guy, actually. Like, my impression of him was that he was this guy that really wanted to get this comic done. He had doodled away for years, and then he finally just kind of cracked something and make it work, and... It was his life, but no, he was in a band, he went and did video editing, he had, you know, this other stuff going on, and a family, and he wanted to create something that was his, it seemingly to have something that had his name on and people knew him for. Mm-hmm. And not in a dark ego way, but, you know, a certain amount of wanting to leave a legacy, I guess. Right, right. And th- that whole thing, I was like, oh, wow, this is... A much more fervent personality than I pictured him as, partially because I've seen him twice at cons before, and when I was praising him, that's the more polite way to put it, um, <laughs> you know, and saying like this, this book was amazing. I love this. I've been getting because I was getting Echo Sign. You know, I've been buying this off the rack since day one. Like I just loving this. Thank you and whatnot. And if you would please just sign this issue, this issue in particular, you know, meant to me. XYZ and it, I could barely get him to look up and you know, say thanks you know very introverted it seems. yeah low key personality yeah. yeah he comes across that way but g- give him a microphone a little bit of a platform and he was going off on all kinds of things yeah but in a very non showy way yeah, yeah well, um, so it, it was the most genuine presentation we saw well and we didn't get a bunch of people asking <clears throat> what his favorite media xyz was which was something that was driving me nuts right. it with stayed very panel. focused on him and his work <laughs> and what was behind his work mm-hmm. it was not it was interesting through i through. mean a lot of the other ones got derailed by the moderators who thought it's more interesting to talk about movies or something like mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. And one in particular that i wanted to slap <laughs> right. well i want to come back to that because uh <laughs> something that uh jonathan hickman said you weren't in that panel right matt well, not at that point, I'm guessing. Okay. I think my second favorite was the Jonathan Hickman one. Yeah. Did you like that one? I, I did. It was, I, it was really refreshing. His, he, you know, Hickman, if, you, if you've if ever heard him talk or you follow him on, on Twitter or something, you know, he he's very, uh, I don't know, he has a very interesting viewpoint on the comics uh-huh. industry, and he's not afraid to share it. <laughs> Which is good. <laughs> But, uh, but 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 before we get to that, I want to I want to just just mention too in the Terry Moore panel, when there were there were a few women who who spoke out who right. who, who talked to him and thanked him for his contribution uh, for for showing uh, a relationship between the, the the relationship between Francine and and um, and uh, Kachu, right? I really liked that. I really appreciated that. I, yeah, I just, it was I, very moving. I, I, yeah, exactly. It was very moving the way that these women opened up and, you know, and the well, way that he responded to it. And they were in tears. Yeah. Right. But he responded to it very well. Yeah. I don't know. That it, I honestly was a little uncomfortable. So I mean, just when people start crying, I don't know. I was like, oh, my God, you know, like, geez. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I, I guess I'm a cold person i don't know like i hear when people read day tripper they cry and i don't understand so day tripper 
They, have you not read Really? Future? No, I have. That's why I'm oh, thinking, oh, oh, oh. what? what? I, it's a great comic. Everybody it's on YouTube beautiful. say they cry from reading Daytime. Really? Yeah, I haven't read it. This is You didn't cry, Oh, right? No. Damien, you have to read that comic. Uh, you I do. think you would love this comic. Everyone loves it. It's beautiful. <laughs> Money back guarantee? <laughs> uh, I'd do it. No, I'll read it. I'll read it. <laughs> I'm not worried about money back. It's so. possible I bought it digitally and have gotten it. <laughs> you can't buy it. That is a book you cannot do digitally. Oh, really? Okay, well then, I'll throw away the Wait, 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 wait. Why? Copy. Why do you th- why do you think that? That's a Gabriel Ba Fabio Moon painted comic. They painted it? Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that. I thought it was just drawing. Like, well, they had a painted color. <clears throat> okay. Then, but... I'll, I'll get it in hardback. But it, that is... Though. That would be like reading Watchmen digitally or so. If there's certain comics that I think are on a different level and you just, they deserve to be on your shelf. They deserve to be printed. There's something about having that trade in your hand. A lot of your superhero schlock you buy every week, whatever. There are certain works that I think should be read physically. That's every single them. Rebirth comic is brilliant. It oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> All right, all right. <clears throat> Sorry, that's kind of an in joke. <laughs> um, so what? So what about the Hickman panel? Did you did you enjoy? What? Well, I mean, so I think I admire Terry Moore more as a person than Jonathan. Hickman. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. And the problem with Jonathan no offense, Hickman Mr. Hickman. and a lot of other people, <laughs> and maybe I'd be the exact same way if I had to go up on stage and speak. Is they kind of they have an attitude, a shtick. Of it, and Jonathan Hickman has a little bit. I'm a little bit too cool. There's a little too fraction kind of attitude compared to more. Right, and Matt Fraction has that even worse. But um, but I don't blame them for having that. But I really appreciate Terry Moore for not being. That. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, but Hickman, after initial reluctance at times, really just put out a lot of information and a lot of thoughts there. Yeah, and he was um, he felt very flexible and. Of what subjects he'd talk about like when he started talking about oh. what novels he'd been reading lately and one of the person one of the people in the audience had read all the same novels he'd read and then he asked started asking that person what novels that person had read and let that person in the audience talk about yeah. the novels mm-hmm. he thought were good and mm-hmm. it seemed like he was really going to check them out and so that was kind of a cool thing I also appreciated although he is really into TV and movies that, that he also is into prose fiction because you know hear that from many comic book creators anymore and to me that's an important if you're a writer particularly that's an important thing you should bring in there you should be reading novels and short stories along with watching tvs and reading yeah. movie well, scripts and stuff. Yeah. what bugged me though is when people ask what comics you were into which i think is <laughs> poignant anyways he kind of dodged it well, that, well but he made a reference to the fact that that he knew he would end up just promoting his friends, and so maybe he should just stop. Yeah, yeah. So I think he's just too close to it. (sighs) That bugs me. Or, or, because I kind of got the sense maybe that he's like, yeah, it's comics, yeah. But... Oh, okay, I didn't read that into it. Maybe that's that's just me. But it's just like, yeah, it's comics, but, you know, there there are better things out there. Uh (laughs) Which I found really funny, because that's what he does. Yeah. (laughs) Who so knows? I didn't I, interpret it that way. But I'm probably misreading it, but I thought he was. But I thought he was making a nod to the fact that as comic pros, we're all like rubbing each other's backs, and that's, that's I have true. to do that yeah. too. But let's cut this short so I don't. Well, go too I, far. I think I think maybe I, I kind of read into that mm-hmm. uh, probably a little more, a little more than I should have because you might have been right. I, well, because he, you know, he said something about superhero comics. He kind of denigrated superhero comics to, to a oh. certain degree. But well, that was a funny moment where he thought that the audience did not read superhero comics, but they did. Right, right. Well, and you know, I just, I just don't, <laughs> I just haven't heard, uh, been uh, in other panels with him and or have been exposed to him talking about comics in general enough, I think, to know whether or not he was just yanking our chain. Uh, with that answer or not? Uh-huh. So I, I wasn't sure how to take it, but but I still found it funny. Well, I found it weird that he thought because the way he worded it wasn't like, "Are you reading primarily other stuff?" It's like, "Do you read any superhero comics?" And as much as the market has changed in the past ten years, 
To say most comic readers aren't reading at least a couple superhero comics, keeping in mind, you know, like, Invincible or probably Savage Dragon would probably still hit that register. Doesn't mean the big two, necessarily. Yeah. Well, if he is <laughs> if he is essentially done with writing superhero comics, he may just not be reading them for a while. Oh, he should be done with writing superhero comics, because if, if the publishers got wind of what he was saying at that panel... Well, like, so, okay, so that's exactly what I loved about his panel, was but that I don't he seemed he refreshingly honest. No, 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 yeah. yeah so but I don't think he's hurting his career by being honest about it, but it is oh, still no. more honest than most yes, people will be. Yes, yes. And I'd rather have him writing non-superhero <clears throat> comics. Yes. Because Although... Is, I really I'd enjoyed like something like Fantastic Four again. <laughs> see, and that and that was the book that. But not that, Avengers again. <laughs> but uh, see, I, I loved I loved okay. everything he I did. I couldn't get through the Avengers. Well, see, maybe but I don't think either those hold a candle to Nightly <coughs> News or Pax Romana mm. or East of West or. That, you're right. You're right. I don't know. But but that's what you know. The, I really enjoyed that stuff, and I, I especially Fantastic Four. His Fantastic Four is what made Fantastic Four interesting to me. And every other version of that of the of that comic I've read, it was fallen short because of, of his run on it. Well, you and everyone else, because right after he left, they basically canceled the book, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, they gave Matt Fraction. Well, I was going to say, I've heard good things well, about Fractions. And but... James Robinson, in fact. So they uh, put pretty big name writers. Yeah, I know James Robinson is That was is not good to me. But... <laughs> I did not even try to read James Oh, Robinson. really? Yeah. So for you, Eric... Uh, what was the standout panel for you? So for me, for the two of us, it seemed to be Terry Moore, but I don't know if it was. I had that. another. What was the other one? Oh, go ahead. No, 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 no. no. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, the other one was when I ditched you guys with Hickman was because there was one panel I really did want to see, and that was someone talking about the bondage it held in Wonder Woman. Hmm. It was titled smarter than that. Uh, Wasn't it just Wonder Woman in bondage? or? Well, a lot of it was about that, but it was really more a talk and... Um, talking about i can't remember his name right now but the creator of wonder woman molson molson and how marston? what molson uh, marston whatever william but, something molson but, oh doctor, <laughs> but talking about the career and philosophy of this man and what that and how that interpreted to the wonder woman comics because everybody knows he lived a, lived a freaky life yeah had multiple partners was into bondage <laughs> um Invented also, the lie detector. Well, that's a lie. Yeah. I mean, he... <laughs> quote, <was> funny. <laughs> he, uh, he made the way to them actually making the lie right. detector. He invented the actual lie detector. But he certainly took credit for it. He wrote a lot of pop psychology mm-hmm. articles at the time and was wooed into writing comics by um, some editors at the time who wanted to make comics seem more credible. Partially with the creeping up of um, certain forces that came to bear when the comics code came to mm-hmm. light, but um, but when he started writing it, a lot of what he slipped into Wonder Woman was through that bondage. But it was about this idea of the pleasure principle of um, men wanted to be subdued, but society didn't allow it, and then. There, there's all this crazy stuff and so you do see women in bondage and Wonder Woman in bondage and all this stuff and kind of how that played to this guy's crazy ass philosophy about all of this stuff and, and you see a lot of the stuff in this early Wonder Woman comics that you never see with anything ever again yeah. and what's funny is the guy presenting this it was very much like a college dissertation but he was also coming at it from a very liberal standpoint to the point where I was born in Boulder, Colorado, where pot's been legal all my life, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> this guy made me blush with how liberal he was. Like it was, it, it, it was a shade too far in some respects, wow. and uh, he just slipped that in throughout. And was like, you should stay on the material and leave some of the crazy politics out yourself, <laughs> which I think is maybe part of the reason this guy's so fascinated with. Um, so it's one crazy. Him. PhD being fascinated by another crazy PhD. Right. <laughs> but through this guise of comics with Wonder Woman and whatnot, and so in a lot of ways it wasn't so much about Wonder Woman as much as Wonder Woman's creator and seeing some of that lens through it. What also was interesting to me though was Wonder Woman's origin was retconned super early on because she started an all-star 
but in Wonder Woman 1, they kind of retcon and they add in kind of the trials and they, they made fun of this a few times, but she wears a little domino mask to hide right. her identity on night in an island where everyone knows each other. Um, Greg Rucka brought that up in, in his spotlight panel, too. I, I'll get to that. Oh, yeah. Well, and we all went to a different Wonder Woman panel earlier. And Greg Rucka brought it up in that one, too. Yeah, well, I have other things to say about that. But, Ooh. Uh, but yeah, this Wonder Woman panel was, despite the guy who, he was a character, it was interesting. And I, as much as, you know, I had certain disagreements and whatnot, um, he presented an argument and I'd rather as much as I like hearing some of these creators talk there's something about someone presenting an argument and showing some philosophy and me learning something through comics that I would rather sit down and go through than necessarily hear someone like I went to a Terry Dodson panel and he was just kind of talking about his career and whatnot. it's interesting but I don't think I got nearly as much out of it as this panel that makes me want to necessarily, you know, go and read some and uh, do some research and, you know, learn a little. So. That's enough on that for now. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so I mentioned Greg Rick. So you asked me the question, which, which did I prefer? What, what were your favorites? So, uh, yeah, stick with one. Uh, actually, I would say that the Hickman panel was the most enjoyable uh-huh. because it was so... It was a little bit different than in, than right. the others, right? Because Terry Moore, as much as I loved it, it was it was very much um, focused on him and his career path, how right. he got from point A to point B. Right. I did learn some new things, and like I said, I appreciated the 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 um, reaction from some of the the participants right. in it and how he responded to that. That was really felt really honest and personal, and and I really uh, really appreciated that. Hickman was just almost balls to the wall kind of yeah. honesty he type. He was letting loose. Yeah, he was. And, On and, any subject. And I appreciated that. Uh, Rucka, I liked it too, um, mostly because I like to hear I like to hear creators talk about how everybody else is doing something wrong. And he was very honest about that uh, in regards to Wonder Woman. Uh, Did he I, mention Azarello's Wonder Woman at all? He did talk about it, but not in in specifics. Um, what did so, he say? Was... So he, he did mention how, uh, uh, what they took away. So, so, um, God, what was I saying? Something about, about the oh, right, 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 right. About the Rucka spotlight. Yeah. So, okay. So one of the things he mentioned was, was the whole, and this is not answering the question, but I want to bring it up. <laughs> The whole domino mass thing about how these women yeah. have been together for thousands of years. And, and so basically he was talking about how things that, that simply don't work, right? Yeah. And so you, you, Diana, who is the princess of, of Themyscira, suddenly putting on a domino mask, that just doesn't work, right? Things like that don't work. And so they're, they're address, they address that in, in the, the year one thing that they're doing, I think, in issue, he talks about that in issue two or three or whatever it is. Well, in issue two, Fully she's that. in the contest... And right. her mother knows it. Yeah, exactly. And her mother so, says, I'd rather you didn't, but I know that you were going to do it. So exactly. So they addressed it that way, right? Well, and in this, I mean, as much as they like to pat themselves on the back, it's been addressed three times you, before this you're as right. well. You're right. But that irked me. Well, and <laughs> in, in <laughs> Legend of Wonder Woman, I think they all were wearing helmets and stuff. I think, yeah, I think and that's right. how they solved that. Yes, yeah. So it's been addressed in some way. But, but, There's many different ways to address it. Exactly, exactly. But um, he did... He did make some comments, and I can't remember the specifics of what he said, but he did make some comments about how they, they kind of, the things that they changed with Azarello, with with them, basically, oh, I I know what it was. It was basically they they turned Paradise Island into a crap hole, and it wasn't Paradise anymore. Well, because they kill, they had babies with men and then killed men. Yes. And killed the male babies. Exactly. So they, they took it. Like, so they were monstrous to men. A 180 degree turn from what, what, what right. the society they, they, they built up. They took a very Greek myth approach to yeah. what was right. something interpreting Greek myth as opposed to worrying about being a feminist icon first. Which, right. right. It, it was so, more in the mode of Greek myths. Which yeah, exactly. Are more exactly. brutal. Mm-hmm. It's like Azrael is more concerned about being a writer than uh, worrying about the feminist icon. Well, or at least, at least, or the, just did not consider the feminist icon. In, right, closely. the interpretation of what Wonder Woman is with, within the context of DC Comics and that history, right? right? Yeah. So Rucka was really responding to that, but uh, 
so that's basically what he said about about that kind of stuff. Um, I actually didn't <laughs> didn't really. Uh, I appreciate what he said about Wonder Woman and, and what they were doing and why they were doing things. And he talked a lot about about the hit the kind of the history of how we got involved with it, especially considering the the kind of public uh, separation of him uh, from DC Comics. Oh, cool. Uh, and, and you know, he meant, he mentioned the uh, the 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 conversation he had with Dan DiDio in a McMinniman's bar. Right. One of them in the Portland area. Can we create it right now? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know that the, I'd, have, I'd have to put the profanity filter, I think, on, on the, uh, the episode for iTunes if I did that. But based on what, I, based on what I'm gleaning from his, his description of it. But uh, really what I, got, what I loved about, about, the, about his panel was he talked about this other new book he's coming out with. Awesome. Which is called Old, I think Old Guard, and it's is it an image book. I believe so. I want to okay. say, um, but it, it's it's taking a a a, a Diana like character and putting him putting her together with a bunch of other characters. So it's kind of like a, his interpretation of what Diana would be oh, in this God. in this particular situation. And so I had no idea this book was coming out, and and now that he's described it, all I want to do is read that book. So I, I like that, but but cool. but Hickman I think was probably the best panel I was in. Although I will say, just just to mention the Image Comics panel that we went that, that we was were very in, good. You know I, I go to those just mainly to I like to hear creators talk about their work in a because, preview kind of mode or something, or even or, not or even that because because you know a lot of these books they were talking about already exist have already have already been out, and you know I saw them in previews, <clears throat> but for whatever reason I. You know, because previews you get, you get a little blurb, maybe get a few preview pages, and that's it, right? And I don't, I don't go out of my way to go to CBR and Newsarama and other websites like that to find out more about this stuff. Right. So if previews doesn't, <laughs> doesn't interest me in this book, I'll pass on it. But then I go to these panels, and like I was telling you, Damien, I come out of there, and now I want to buy three more of those books based on these creators and wh- how they talked about it and the excitement that they generate just just for their own work and involvement with that with that particular title. Yeah. Well, I, that panel was very good, especially for such a large group. And I thought that was the panel that had the really good moderator for me. A lot of the moderators. Well, I, down. And and I've seen him. Did a good job. Yeah, I've seen him before, and, and he's really good. But, yeah. Because there was another panel moderated by a Dark Horse editor, which was not supposed to be about Dark Horse anyway, and she did a very poor job, and all she was interested in was kind of promoting Dark Horse books, but she yeah. didn't do a good job of either. Yeah, when you described that to me earlier, I I thought, boy, that's that's just dumb. Right. I, I would not have liked that if I'd been in that panel, for sure. It was supposed to be a panel of artists about artists who do their own writing, and I think that's a really crucial part of comic book creation and so I was really interested in it but it, it wasn't about that at all and they had both creators of Day Tripper right there and didn't talk about it because it wasn't what? published by Dark Horse right oh, and that's, they were that's all criminal. about talking about well, the book they did with Neil Gaiman which they didn't write Right. or, what? or talking about <laughs> the Umbrella Academy which only one of them worked on and they did not write that and was they, written by but they apparently star. had some hesitance about being a creator of that one, from what I could tell. Because they weren't really superhero writers in Umbrella, or superhero creators in their own mind. And Umbrella Academy was kind of... Well, superhero. she asked for him to talk about the Umbrella Academy, and there was a 30-second pause as he gathered his thoughts to talk about <laughs> it. So you could tell there was something going on. Did either of you go to any of the, uh, the Deconic Fraction panels, Milk Fed... We went to a fraction panel where he was talking about Odyssey. With we went to an Odyssey members. panel, but not a milk fed. Panel. Okay, so so you've not experienced the, the whole milk fed phenomenon? No. Oh my god! If you ever get a chance they to have go, a lot of fanboy fangirls there. Well, it's just it's just it's like almost a movement yeah. within itself. I, I went to okay. one at at the um, Heroes Con. Okay. And uh, this is kind of over overplaying it, but it was almost a profound experience. <laughs> Wow. Because they they have definitely developed a a, uh, uh, a following, and it's it's, it's it seems quite large and and 
the people involved are really vested in in, in what they're doing. So I and I, I noticed that they had they had something involved. It was, milk fed something. I don't know if it was a panel or some sort of event that was tied some to some kind the, of milk fed. I didn't even know for what milk fed was at right. first, and I was looking at the description. And I realized, oh, that must be the fraction deconic. I thought it was their their new TV development company is called Milk Fed or something. It might, that might be too, but I think they kind of uh-huh. tie everything under that umbrella. But they also were two panels specifically about Bitch Planet. I didn't go to either of them. There were two? Yeah, one was just called Non-Compliant. Or something. Okay. And then uh, another one was some other thing. How do you say So that? I don't know if Deconic would have been it. Both of them or one of them was just for people into mm-hmm. this non-compliant movement. Mm-hmm. Well, like I said, after after go- having gone to the Milk Fed panel at, at uh, Heroes Con, um, I didn't feel like I needed to go to this one. But I, but I'm really curious how other people who may have not experienced that before how they well, kind of receive that. I I yeah. Didn't. So. Well, if he had said something. I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought we should have talked before. I right? just assumed it would be a panel about what things they might have in development for TV or something. Yeah. Well, that's part of it. Yeah. Is my number one question. I don't want to hear. <laughs> what 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 comic so creators have? This happened with nearly every creator I went to when I left the panel. So there's one moderator in particular who would ask, like, well, now that we've talked about your comments, have they been optioned for anything? And most of them are like, yeah, but not well. <laughs> Even with Stan Sakai, he kept coming back to yeah, movies and it was and like, Well, there isn't anything. They basically said nothing's in the works, but people have asked, we really wanted that quite And I just, I'm here because I love comics. If I cared about TV or movies, or I do care about animation, but in a different sense, like I, I'd go somewhere for that. You know, I'm here for the comics. I'm in the comic room. Let me have my space. <laughs> I don't mind occasionally them talking about other media and stuff, but it felt like this particular moderator, and I've seen this attitude elsewhere, feels like. The other media is what legitimizes the comics. Uh, that's the thing and I that object can to. can really yeah. irritate yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. And his attitude that way is kind of what immediately turned me off. Well, well if like asking about when we when we're in the Mike Mignola panel, asking about his impression of the Hellboy movies, I miss that. I, I can I can dig on that, like because he said like I actually liked it a little more because it went my way. <laughs> or, what did you, what did you feel about Hellboy too? Well. I thought it was stupid. You know, I was like, oh, great. Thank God, you know. <laughs> really? Wow. Well, because he said, um, oh, what's the name of the director that was on that? Uh, yeah. Pacific Rim. Gilmar to Toro. I said that. Yeah. Perfect. Guillermo. <laughs> Guillermo del Toro. Um, yeah, there you go. There you go. Apparently took the script that him and Mignola worked on and just kind of went his own way with it. It wasn't really, oh, really? what they agreed on. Yeah. And it's funny because I remember seeing that movie and I thought it was fun but it didn't really here's the thing neither none of the hellboy media stuff feels like hellboy because i associate that so heavily with the art it doesn't really like the characters look like they made an approximation of that from the comic but in no way does it look like the comic because that's a very dark moody comic it's so heavily inked it's so it's so in that kind of I mean, it's not gothic in design, I guess, but gothic in mood. And the movies aren't really like that. They're, they're fine, they're fun, but they're not that. Mm. And so when he said, like, this didn't go where I thought it would, it made sense to me. Hmm. So. Okay. I don't know. And when I hear creators of the comics say, oh, the media is stupid, I usually like that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think Hickman even said something about about the the, the option stuff. He said only one thing was was right. Option, he said right? he would only go for an option if they would let him write the script. Yes, and he he basically implied I'm making plenty of money from comics. I don't need Hollywood. Yeah, and I'm yeah. not writing comics because I want them turned mm-hmm. into movies. But who was it? Him? To, no, who was it that somebody said that they made more money off of. I think that it was, was Hickman. Hickman. Yeah. More money off of his image comics that were 9% of the sales. Okay, it had nothing to do with the, the other media. It was it, it was, was comparing his work at Marvel that's versus right. his work that's at right. Image. Mm-hmm. But So like, he said what, if I remember correctly, because I repeated this to Matt, so I might be getting it right. Um, 
He said during a three-year period, one mil- no, 10 million comics were sold with his name on it. And 9% of that 10 million comics were image comics. And that 9% earned him 80% of his income. Which is why I think he's not writing for Marvel Comics at the moment. Right. And that is where uh, the conversation ended, only because I screwed up and uh, wasn't watching the recording length and my uh, my SD card on my portable microphone got full and it just shut off. So <laughs> let that be a lesson to me and anyone else out there who uh, is using a portable rig to record uh, their podcast make sure you got enough room on your card or at least another card to throw in there if you need to because uh damien matt and i talked for at least another 30 minutes after the uh, recording stopped and we talked about a great many things that were really interesting to me and unfortunately i could not capture them for your benefit uh but before i go I wanted to bring up a few more things. I was able to talk to several several artists and um, and one writer in particular. I just wanted to make note of these things. So uh, let's see here. And 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 uh, my family and I bought bought some things from some of these artists as well. So let's see. First up, I talked to writer Brian Joins. So he was the co-writer of the uh, the wonderful series secret identities and i just happen to be walking uh, artist alley and i see i see secret identities the the trade on someone's table and i look down and i see this guy's name i'm like wait a minute who who because because i couldn't remember who is this so i, I quickly uh, uh, looked him up on my phone and discovered it was the uh, the writer and so i go to talk to him and uh find out this you know small world right so i go to portland to uh to 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 see some of these people and i find out that this guy who is the co-writer of one of my favorite limited series uh of what was it last year or a couple years ago uh i still plan to do a spotlight episode on this comic because i love it so much that he actually went to uh the uh, went to washington state university and I live in the town across the border where University of Idaho is. So we went to rival schools and came to find out that he actually graduated from Clarkston High School, which is across the border from where I grew up in Lewiston, Idaho. So we were rivals. <laughs> so like I said, small world. I had a great conversation with uh, Mr. Joins, though. And I bought, what did I, I got something from him. Oh, I also bought, yeah, here it is. So this is this is a series that I remember looking at and thinking, oh, that sounds, that sounds like a, a fun thing to, to read. It's called Imagine Agents. And this is written by Mr. Joins with uh, art by Bakken, B-A-C-H-A-N. And Ruth Redman on colors with Darren Bennett by letters. Uh, and so anyway, I, I I bought it. I bought the I bought that trade from him. So I wanted to read it anyway. I knew I did, and he was gracious and gracious enough to sign it. Uh, I also uh, was walking along and was kind of looking at Ron Randall's uh, table there, and he's like, "Hey, would you would you like would you like uh, a free sketch on on this uh, postcard?" And so he had these postcards for Trekker. I don't know if you know um, uh, his work on that. So this this is his creator own thing, Trekker. Uh, it's been at a couple different uh, uh, publishers. Uh, I think Dark Horse and now, yeah, still Dark Horse. So I think he did some other things before, and then Dark Horse is now his publisher. That's what I'm thinking. Anyway, uh, he. He uh, started drawing uh, the, the, the the lead character, the, the face, the head of the, the lead character on this little postcard. And we just start talking about the book. He asked me if I knew about it. And actually, I did, uh, although I hadn't read it, but I always, I always kind of wanted to. It looks like something that I would enjoy. And so I bought. He had uh, he, you could buy uh, one of the trades. So there's an omnibus, I guess, or at least a, a, a complete collection of his earlier work. Uh, a trekker work and then then he's come out with this latest 
trade called the train to Avalon Bay and he told me that there is another trade coming out or at least another series in the Trekker line that is coming out soon and so I, I went ahead and bought uh, the train to Avalon Bay or train to Avalon Bay and he just he, he again uh, drew uh, uh, in the uh, inside page uh, of, the, of the the trade here and so we had a nice little conversation I thought that was really great because I usually don't buy <laughs> I usually don't buy comics and trades directly from from the the, the creators there uh, I've only done it once or twice. I think the last time I did it was from Landry Q. Walker. Uh, anyway, um, so I, I did that. Uh, let's see, what else? I got to look at my notes here. So there's, oh, Terry Moore, of course. I went back to see Terry Moore uh, because I wanted to buy his, his latest sketchbook, which is lovely. And while I was there, I was talking with him and uh, complimented him on the the uh, the uh, spotlight panel that uh, Damien, Matt, and I talked about. And uh, during that conversation, we were looking at uh, some of the stuff he had, the pages he had for sale. Uh, I had looked at those before, the day before, on Saturday of the con, and uh, quickly realized I could not afford <laughs> to buy those uh, as much as I may have wanted to. But what he had at, at the beginning of this collection of pages, he had like these uh, three loose pages, you know, uh, the sketches he'd done. And I found one that uh, I really, really liked, and it was within my price range. So I looked at my wife to make sure it was okay <laughs> and said, basically, can I get this? And so I did. And so that was really cool. I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed getting that, and I can't wait to put it up. Uh, anyway, so there, there's that, and then there were some other artists that we saw and uh, bought some things from, except for one. We really seriously bought about, thought about buying this one thing from Brian Fife. So uh, BrianFife.com, and I'll have I'll have links in the show notes to to these artist things. So this guy does he he had he had a bunch of things uh, on or. Um, in uh, what do you call them? Um, picture frames in frames. So we had these things on canvas, in frames for sale, and he, and also prints. But they're just really striking. There was one called Arkham House, that uh, my wife really liked, and uh, I really enjoyed his, his his the colors of his work. So yeah, some of it was kind of a um, uh, horror esque, uh, Halloween esque. Is kind of how I think of his his the work he had out there for the most part, but there were there was uh, one one uh, print and uh, 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 paintings not the quite quite the right word, but uh, I guess that's as, as close because what he does is he does a, like digital collage on on canvas where he gets puts it on canvas anyway he explained the whole thing to me it was really cool. Uh, if you go to his site, not like I said, I'll put the no, uh, link in the show notes. Uh, it describes his site describes kind of what he does, how he describes it. But it's just it's really cool, and the colors, the colors on these on these pieces of, of art were just amazing. Uh, there was uh, this 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 bird one that really caught my eye. He had he had these smaller ones that were butterflies that just the, the colors just like popped out. It was just amazing what he did with the colors. Uh, another person that we we talked to again, because we have seen this person at at least one other con, probably twice at Emerald City in years past. Uh, this is Amelia Davis, and we bought uh, some prints of hers. Uh, my my uh, granddaughter Madison really liked the character of Ray from Star Wars, the latest Star Wars movie, and she had a print of of Ray with BB-8 on it that looked really cool so we bought uh, that and I think some other things as well from her and she's always very lovely and very gracious and uh, signed everything of course and uh, uh, she claimed she recognized us after we were talking to her uh, because we have seen her like I said a few a few times now and she's really delightful and and she does some really cool art and then uh, finally Finally, there was a, a, a lovely young lady, uh, Helen Mask, 
uh, HelenMask.com. Uh, she did, she does these, so she, her, her stuff was the stuff that I, that just drew me in immediately as we were walking along, uh, on the, in artist alley on the show floor. Uh, the first day we're just kind of, you know, we walk in and, and, uh, uh, we just start walking the show floor just to see everything. That's kind of how I like to do it if, as much as possible. Just kind of see as much as possible before I, I go off to some panel and her, art was the first thing it just like just just wowed me and 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 i had to go take a look at it it's these wonderful line drawings uh that she does they're mostly kind of fantasy based uh characterizations uh and not only that but not only there there are they fantastically intricate beautiful line drawings uh of these characters uh they are just also they're also wonderfully colored so that's it was just that was really good um we ended up buying a couple like uh a note card size uh pictures of of witches so kind of like a halloween theme so we got two or three of those i think they were uh boy those were those were re really lovely so I, i'm even thinking about contacting her to see if i could buy some stuff from her etsy store as well so there you go uh like i said i just want to mention those things because uh, they, they, I think they deserved attention. And uh, let's see, I think that's it. That's all my notes for what was left to talk about at Rose City Comic Con. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this episode. This is a little different for me. Uh, we uh, got together at, uh, as, as you heard, uh, at McMiniman's Bar on Broadway. And it was just a free-form discussion, just kind of talking about whatever... Uh, caught her fancy about Rose City Comic Con, and I want to thank again uh, Damien, Sleepy Reader 666, and Matt, which uh, who is also known as Wednesday Serial. Uh, they are on YouTube and Twitter, of course. Go check out their YouTube channels because uh, they have some really interesting things to say about comics. And of course, I will have those links in the show notes. And that is it for this episode. Uh, next episode, if you're still around, still listening, uh, it's going to be a very special one. I had a, a uh, another wonderful guest on, and if you follow me on Twitter and Instagram, you probably saw some uh, posts of mine where I hinted at the uh, what the conversation was about, and uh, you should come back for next episode where I will talk with Mr. Peter Rios. Uh, from the dailyreels.com and we will discuss the legion of superheroes so come back for that and that is it for this episode thanks for listening bye-bye